Okay, I will go ahead and resume the recording here uh, and kind of kick us off and say my piece before turning it over to our fantastic panel uh, that we had today or that we have tonight. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we are excited to have you here for our last uh, Monday guest speaker series of this session. So friendly reminder for the students on the call um, that the session does wrap up Friday. Uh, and we will be um, grading projects and uh, going through all the uh, all the requirements for that. So we are happy you took some time to be here uh, with us today. Um, we are very excited um, to host some wonderful women from Terrazzo. Um, Shelly Isaacs is going to be our host tonight, and I'm going to hand it over to here uh, to her here shortly. Um, she's very familiar with our program. Um, I can let her tell you a little bit more about it, but she. Um, has a uh, relative who mentors for us and went through the program. So she had reached out uh, to get connected and was really excited to bring some of her team on board as well um, to be uh, part of this guest speaker series. So uh, I'll go ahead and hand it over. Um, we will record this session to share out later. Um, I, I know that um, they plan some time for questions at the end. I'll also keep an eye uh, on questions in the chat. So feel free to throw things there uh, as we go along. But with that, I'll go ahead and toss it over to you, Shelly. Thanks so much. I was on mute. Thank you. <laughs> um, so there's three of us here today. We all work at a company called Terraza. We do consulting. Um, we wanted to come and talk to you all um, and hopefully you can benefit from some of our experiences, insights, hopefully some of our advice is useful as you guys are, you know, getting out there into the tech field as you're transitioning into tech. Um, so we're going to talk to you a bit about that today. Um, we're going to, and let me get us in here. We'll start with, I'll talk to you a little bit about us and what we do. Uh, we'll have a panel discussion where we'll go through and each person will answer some questions about their experiences and have some advice about getting out there and getting your first job in tech. Um, and then we'll open it up for some Q&A at the end. So that's what we have to look forward to here. So again, I mentioned before, we are consultants at Terrazzo. Um, Terrazzo, we, we build out solutions for clients. We try and focus on human-centered design on you know, building products that are for people. And a little bit about us specifically, Women at Terrazzo is an employee resource group. We support our company's mission to rise together. So we think that inclusion is strength. We have a focus on diversity. Um, we work to support diversity through different initiatives like um, you know, trying to update our recruiting to make sure that we can have you know, a more diverse panel of applicants. And we do some community outreach like this tonight, um, sharing our experiences with others, um, trying to bring more diversity to the, to the tech community generally. And we do team spotlights. So interviewing other you know, women or other people at our company um, and highlighting all of the strengths that we bring to our team. So we were going to have one other person here tonight. We're down to three. Uh, Laurel wasn't able to join us, but we're still gonna have a great conversation here. I'm Shelly Isaacs. I am a senior software engineer. Maha is a software engineer and scrum master. And Rachel Morris is delivery engagement lead at Terrazzo. All right, so hopping right into the panel discussion. I'm gonna start us out and ask if Maha, could you tell us a bit about your background and what you do now? And then we'll just go through the different folks here. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me on this panel. Um, so I'm Maha Lakshmi Budupali and known as Maha to everyone. Um, I'm actually from India. Um, I came here to do my master's and then um, I'm here. <laughs> um, so I'm actually a software engineer slash uh, scrum master at Terrazzo. Um, and uh, my background is I did my bachelor's in engineering, which is electronics and communication engineering. I but then after coming to States, uh, I did my master's here in telecommunications 
And then I switched to software engineering uh, pretty much in my last semester. And uh, from there where my journey started to be a software engineer, an associate level, um, and then a junior level, a middle level. And then now, right now, I'm actually doing software plus Scrum Master. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's my background. And uh, what do you do now, Maha? Um, currently, um, I do both engineering and uh, Scrum Master. Scrum Master is um, I take care of team. Uh, I take care of um, like team, uh, try to like actually t make team functional. Um, I'm kind of a point of contact when I'm doing the Scrum Master. I take care of Scrum ceremonies for the team. I help team to be a high functional team. Awesome. Rachel, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background and what you do now? Absolutely. So I have actually been in IT for about 20 plus years now. I actually fell into IT. That's the way I like to explain it to people. I actually, I majored in criminal justice and psychology, I had plans to be a detective. Um, life changed those plans for me. And as a result, I got somebody, a company that I started with that IT corporate gave me an opportunity to fall in. And I started off as a business analyst slash project manager. And one of the things that I would say that I had to learn and do well was being able to understand what an engineer needed and how they needed to be able to communicate it to, but also being able to understand what the business needed and translating that over to what engineers need, because it's like a whole different world, a whole different language is what I love to tell everyone. My passion in my career and what I've done a lot of is UX, focusing on human-centered design, as Shelley talked about understanding people first and that if you don't have people and taking people into consideration that your processes and your technology, no matter how great it is when you build it, is going to fail every single time. And then the second piece is I've played a lot of different roles for the majority of my career, about 17 years, I've been a consultant in IT. And I, that's all the way from hardware over to software. So I'm very familiar and I would say very much a technical engagement delivery lead. What I do now at Terrazzo is I kind of sit up a, a little bit higher interface with the client. Again, with human-centered design and focus and people as first, I make sure I build that relationship, understand what the business outcomes are that needs to happen and occur, and how that gets translated over to the team and helping manage keep the team. So very much like Maha, sometimes I am a scrum master, sometimes a product owner, sometimes a product manager. Sometimes I'm a tech lead. It just all depends on the day and what's going on. But that's the beauty of what we do. And, and really what we do at Terrazzo is it gives us the opportunity to have flexibility to play many different roles and not be put in a box. So it's really awesome and nice. And that's a little bit about me. Oh, and I live in Berlin, Germany right now. <laughs> we'll hear more about Rachel's uh, international journeys and remote work on a team a little later. Um, I, for myself, I'll speak a little bit to this question. Um, I studied sociology and did research consulting for several years before I transitioned into tech. Um, I was well into a PhD program in applied sociology when I decided that I needed to find a different career path. Um, I have a chronic condition, chronic health condition called endometriosis, and I have chronic pain related to that. And these, as I was, you know, in the field that I was, these were getting worse um, during that time. And I decided that, uh, you know, the options of full-time teaching or community organizing, which were kind of what were, you know, what you would go into if you're, if you're studying that, weren't going to be really sustainable for me long-term, given my particular kind of health conditions and the kind of workplace and support I needed for that long-term. So my decision to transition into tech was really driven by my ability to take care of myself physically and mentally. And I just want to say here, you know, for anyone here, if you're making this transition because you need to take care of your family or yourself, please don't feel any guilt for that. You're making a choice to take care of valuable people. And that is really important. Um, so when I was thinking about finding a new career field, I heard about a tech boot camp called the Software Guild, and this was through a coworker of my husband's. And I had never considered working in tech um, before that, but we talked, and this guy told me that some of the research skills I have would probably translate well into programming. 
So I knew tech jobs had good pay and benefits that would let me take care of myself. And I suspected that I would like the coding itself, um, both because I like logic problems and because I really love building things and seeing people use them. I like seeing the impact of what I build. Um, and, you know, turns out I've gotten into the field. I, I really love it. <laughs> so um, that was serendipitous. But um, so the boot camp I went through was Java. It was full stack. It was a full time program for three months. I kind of knew that I needed that level of focus to to get into something new for me. Um, and their career services helped me to make the connections that I needed for my first two jobs. Um, at this point, I'm a senior software engineer. Um, we do consulting. So I get to work on a lot of different kinds of problems in tech. And um, this last year, I've worked in Java, C Sharp, PHP, Vue, and React all in like a year, year and a half. Um, <laughs> I've done some things in Power BI. I'm starting to learn about solution architecture. Part of what's fun about consulting is that you just get lots of opportunities to be exposed to new stuff. Um, I think that's probably common for a lot of folks who work in consulting, that that's what they love doing. Um, so one of the little fun things that I do these days is helping organize internal forums at my company where people share about new tech or best practices. So um, like with my background in higher ed, even though I'm not doing that for a career, I still have this, you know, these little opportunities to tie in with that interest in like sharing knowledge. Um, so that's, that's kind of it for me. I am going to move on to the next question here. How did you get your first tech job and what things did you do that helped you get that job? And this one is for Rachel and Maha. Do you want to go first, Maha? Um, up to you. If, if you want to go first, that's fine, Rachel. All right. So to summarize, I kind of already alluded to this, but I didn't quite tell you how I fell inside IT. So I actually worked in a call center. Um, and when in that call center, they were implementing, they were on old AS400, hit the little F keys, green screens, not so much fun. And they decided they wanted to move to a more Windows-based type application that was point and click to handle their calls and to handle their claims. And I worked in claims and process claims. I got put on a pilot team to help learn how to use this tool and to help teach everyone else how to use it. In that process, I found out very much similar to like Shelly who decided to go into a boot camp that I love technology and I actually really enjoyed it. And then when they had a, at the time, BAs, business systems analysts were not a thing. They just, it was engineers in the business, engineers in the business, but they realized that there was a need for somebody to be in the middle. And so they asked me if I wanted to switch over and do that. And that was with a company called, which is now a very large company that you hear, Allianz. Um, it started off as a smaller company and then eventually it grew and they changed and it's an international global company, but they gave me that first opportunity. And in that first job, I learned a whole lot about PeopleSoft, a lot of database and servers. And from there, my first CIO was a woman and her name was Deborah Cassidy and meeting her, she was just such an inspirational person. And I told myself that day that I wanted to be her someday. And that was my goal is I wanted to learn every part of IT all the way across the OSI model, starting on the infrastructure side, all the way up to software delivery, which by the way, guys, I have, because I wanted to be able to be that high up and to handle any solution or anything that came in and came that way. And so I didn't have a formal, I didn't have any formal education. It sounds like, you know, you, you'll hear that a, a lot between Shelly and Maha and myself. None of us really went to school to really be IT but we fell into it. And I think that's really important to note for you guys. And the things that helped me was just, actually wasn't the fact that I had that formal background. It was my perseverance. It was my determination, my quick learning, willing to jump in, to learn, to grab a book, to understand, to do what I needed to, and to just people skills, honestly, being able to communicate, talk to people and figure out how people communicate because again engineers communicate very differently than what business people do and that is always you know an interesting challenge but those are the things that helped me and all of those soft skills are important for any job you get no matter what maha 
Yeah, um, I hundred percent resonant. Whatever you said, Rachel. Like like you said, I also fell into the IT. So um, guys, what I used to do before, like I, I was in an electronics and communication engineering. Right, telecommunication is a very different field from a software engineering. It has nothing to do with like lots of um, you know like sitting in front of a computer and doing stuff. Right, it's more like a field job trying to find like what's the frequencies are and stuff. It's it's a different kind of engineering. And, um, but during that, uh, during my bachelor course, like I was interested to like actually do IT back in India. Um, I literally started with C language and I didn't have like any background of it because none of my courses were like with regarding to IT. So um, I took a separate course just because I was actually interested because um, I remember like one, uh, there was this professor who actually inspired me so much. And he's like, why? I was just talking to him about like very core subject of electronics engineering. And then I was like, and then he was like, why are you just narrowing yourself to one single sector? Right. You be you be broad, like you just try to learn everything and then you have like capability to jump into whatever you want. And then I was like, that really struck into me and that really struck into my mind. And I'm like, why? Why am I actually just thinking only in one single lane when I have like multiple opportunities in the world? And that's how I actually started like learning Java and stuff and um my first was C and then I learned C sharp and then I was Java. So I was like, I want to do everything like you, Rachel. I was like, I want to learn from the, from the scratch. Um, and, um, and then I came here, I was already um, in telecommunication. And then I was like, I literally fell into it because I, as an immigrant, as a non-immigrant, none of the other sectors that I wanted to work wouldn't sponsor me. And the only way for me to like actually, um, you know, like work in United States was doing an IT so that I can get a sponsorship because it was easy with this. And, and honestly, I was never like restricted myself to one single thing. And I already had this kind of little bit background, which because I did some courses and I'm like, okay, let, let me jump into the software engineering and see what I got. So um, I did my software engineering literally last semester. I, I was lucky because I had credits from my bachelor's <laughs> so I could complete it. Um, but as you said, like I was into the software development life cycle and like it was so fascinating for me to like actually build everything from scratch and like be helpful for people. And like whenever like, you know, build anything from scratch and like whenever people use that, it's just like that excitement I have in me. And that's how I started. But my first job was like, it was through consultants and it was through marketing. But what really helped me is social media and LinkedIn. That is that is the key for my uh, finding my jobs, how I presented myself, people skills, I would say, like presenting myself out there in the market it was not easy for me. I had to learn it. And that's why, uh, that's how I learned. Like I have learned through many different resources and I presented myself in the LinkedIn and that's how I got jobs. And um, here I am today, Tara, so giving, doing a panel interview. <laughs> so, yep. Awesome. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next question. What advice would you give to someone looking for their first job? What tools or processes would you recommend for the job search? This one's for Rachel. That's a good question. I think Maha kind of touched a little bit on it. I will tell you that LinkedIn is probably one of the top tools that I go to look for to find jobs. But more importantly, your LinkedIn profile is you. It's your brand. It's who you are. It's what you've done, what you've accomplished. So be proud of it make sure that you update it. You put that information out there. You get recommendations from people, build your network, make those connections. It doesn't matter how. So that is probably one of the best number one tools. You can probably go to any of the, the job sites, snag a job, USA. I've done all of those. I've never really found them to be super useful for me every single time. It's always LinkedIn, but honestly, most of the jobs, I'm never really looking for a job. I'll be fair and honest. Every time when I decide that I'm going to switch, it's because I have built a relationship with somebody that I worked with in the past who said, I worked with Rachel and we have this job and I'm here. 
and I want Rachel to come over here and then they reach out or somebody reaches out to me from LinkedIn because they saw my profile and they're curious and they're interested. So I would say tools, definitely LinkedIn, social media, because they always go to look at your social media. So always be above reproach, make sure that you're putting out a good rapport and you're doing things. But, but really, most of all, network, get to know people, build those bridges, build those relationships, go to meetups, learn who they are, participate in, you know, the things like this, as you start to get in and you start building it, go back to Louisville, code Louisville or code Kentucky and say, hey, now that I've gone through your program, can I speak at one of these things that night, right? All of these types of things are good for you and will help in building those bridges and relationships. And that's the number one technique I will tell you guys is build your bridges, build your relationships, make sure you have a good brand and go from there. It's the best advice I can give you. All right. What things should you look for in a workplace culture? And are there any warning signs to look out for? And I'll go ahead and, and start speaking to this one. And then Rachel will also have some things to, some insights to share with you all. Um, you know, for myself, you know, from my background, I'm interested in, you know, like, can you find a place that is physically and mentally healthy for you? You want to find a good workplace culture. Um, so one of the things to ask is what is the work-life balance like? How often are they expecting you to work overtime hours or weekends? Um, are there built-in encouragements not to work overtime? So does your team encourage you to, you know, if you work late one day, take some hours off the next day or something like that? Um, I know at our company, there's like a bonusing structure that doesn't reward you past a certain point. So if you're working 50 or 60 hours a week, you're not, you're not rewarded like with extra bonuses for working extra. Um, and, you know, do they allow you to take a mental health day? Some of these things, you know, it's sort of like you have to figure out how you can ask, but, um, you know, what is work-life balance like at your company should be something you can ask like in an, in an interview. Um, yeah. So another thing, are they used to working with boot camp grads? Um, and how do they plan to onboard you? So it can be really helpful for someone coming out of a boot camp to find a place that's familiar with onboarding and working with people from that background, because you have really valuable knowledge and applied coding skills from the boot camp, but you're also a new learner with a different set of expertise than someone coming from a computer science background. So if you can find a workplace that's familiar with the kind of training and support that you need to be successful, that can really support you, that can be helpful. Um, I've, I've got like a whole list of things I want to hit. So <laughs> you guys are, um, yeah, please be patient with me here. <laughs> um, how do teams work together at the workplace? So what kind of things do they have pair coding? Do they have code reviews? What opportunities are there to work with and learn from your peers? Um, maybe you can ask to speak with an engineer or analyst, you know, someone in that role that you want. Maybe you can ask to speak with someone who works on the team um, to see what kind of team processes they have. Do they do mentorship? What opportunities are there to work with and learn from more senior people on the team? So these are these things are key to your professional development. If you can work with more senior engineers or more senior people in your field, they can help point you in the right direction for like what to study or how to get to your long-term goals. And they can also advocate for you with higher ups to get to where you wanna be. A couple more things. What is the company's local reputation? Do they have a history of high turnover? Um, so if they're clearing out their engineers every two years, maybe that's not a great workplace culture. Um, if people don't want to stay there very long, what does it say? Um, and if you're looking at local companies, it's good to lean on people from your local network, local professional network to see what they know about how this company treats employees. It can be difficult to like, you know, ask, obviously you probably can't ask questions in your interview about like, what is your reputation, but you can kind of get at it by maybe asking people in your network, what they know about how they treat employees or looking at, you know, how long people tend to be at that company. And then finally, whenever I think about joining a team, whether it is, you know, a new company, or if it's internally, I want to join a team at my company, I ask myself, are these people that I want to be like? Do I respect and admire them? Do I want to be more like them? Because you're going to be with your team 
day in and out. They will have an effect on you and you will influence them. So do you want to be like these people? And that's it for me. Rachel. So I honestly agree with everything that Shelly said. I think that she said it beautifully and really covered almost all of it. The only thing that I will add in addition to all of those items is I always like to understand what the policy is amongst the executive team and down. And the reason why is because if there's an open door policy and they accept that you have a voice, then that means everybody has a safe place to be heard and to speak up and to provide value and to have an opinion to make the workplace better. If you have to go through a certain level of command or chain to go talk to your C-suite for any reason, then that's going to be a little bit of a different culture, at least not a culture that works for me. Doesn't mean that you should do that all the time, but it's nice to know is that is there an open door policy there that allows you because that means they put people first for me and that they want to hear you and they want your opinions matter. And so that's something that I think you should definitely look into in addition to would you respect, would you re admire them, but just will they listen and will they provide me a safe place to be? And that's always the question that helps me understand if it is. Cool. All right. So we don't all come from a traditional computer science background. And many of us here probably, you know, those of us in the meeting today are in maybe minority demographics of who you find in tech. Um, people who are, you know, women, not non-white, uh, non-binary. And there's all sorts of things that, you know, make you someone that doesn't quite maybe fit the mold of what someone looks like in tech or what we think of as someone looks like in tech. Um, so what advice, you know, would you give to some, what challenges have you faced in those ways and what advice would you give to someone else facing similar challenges? And let's start with Maha on this one. Um, okay. So um, I am not white <laughs> and uh, I'm an Indian. Um, I come from um, a very um, a, a very subtle um, background actually. And I um, li like doing my engineering and coming out of uh, coming to States is itself was a biggest challenge for me. Um, the basic thing, what everyone thinks is like as an Asian woman, everyone thinks that we are very submissive and um, it's just okay to dominate uh, like on us. And that's the thing that I actually faced a lot of, that's the biggest challenge that I have faced in my career. Um, mostly when I'm working, when I was actually, this is one of the example, when I was working in the biggest financial company as a software engineer at the time, um, I was the only woman in the entire team and everyone were male. And um, I was a new mom and um, I was just going through things. I was just, I'm like all over the place. And I'm like, I really have to do this. And I also had to take care of my baby and I'm trying to figure out things. And at that time, there were like few men really like cooperating, but there were also like my manager, like, why are you not spending a lot of time here? What's happening? Like, you know, um, you're supposed to like be here like till 7 p.m. on 8 p.m. work with your team. And you just left like at 6 p.m. That was the first question I had. And I was like, I don't even know how to answer that. Right. So, um, so throughout my career, most of the time I faced these challenges during my education during like my first um, tech job or in, like my first job, my first tech job and in the bigger financial firms. Um, at one point I was like, I can't do this, right? Like I was like, I, I just can't do this. Maybe I don't have it in me and uh, maybe I just have to like give up. Uh, but the only thing that actually kept me going was my determination. And I was like, this is not me. I always used to tell myself that this is not me. This is not who I am, who I am. Because most of the time when I actually give up, I was never happy at all. And um, and that kept me going. I took a break and I, I took a break for quite a long time. And then I was like, I'm not happy. I can do both. I can 
still can actually work and it's okay for me to like actually um you know like it, it's okay and I can actually balance it's okay for me to feel overwhelmed sometimes and I can still balance what balance my world um so that kept me going and um I was like I don't want to give up it's okay for me to accept that I don't know these things and uh to learn um and move forward right um as an Asian woman um it was very easy to just to say like yes with whatever you know just to say yes and it was hard for me to say no on certain things but I have learned my ways I have learned my ways I have got encouragement from really beautiful mentors in my life and after coming to Terrazzo as um, Shelly said it was very important for me to like understand the Terrazzo background and I have asked not all the questions but few questions when I actually entered into Terrazzo so um but yeah, that helped me. So I had beautiful mentors in, in the in the same way in my path. During, I had like both the challenges and I also had like mentors who kept me going along. So my determination and uh, the, men, the help from the mentors um, kept me going along with these all challenges, so-called challenges that I faced. So that's, yep, that's from my side. Rachel, do you want to go ahead and speak to your experience? Absolutely. So I'm going to agree with Maha. Here's the thing, guys. Every one of us are new and we're, it's everyone's day one. Even once you get out here, you're going to learn there's going to be some new technology. There's going to be something that you didn't know before. And there's always going to be somebody that's going to have something to say or somebody that might make you feel small. Whether you are a woman, whether you're non-binary, whether you're just the new kid on the block that just started, it's going to happen. What you have to do is to Maha's point is you can't let it discourage you. You know that you got here for a reason and you did this for a purpose. What you have to do is let some of it roll. Just keep your head down, do your best rise above it no matter what. Don't get in the middle of it. Don't challenge them because it doesn't matter. But as you grow and you learn, you're going to make mistakes and mistakes are okay. Just make better ones tomorrow. And to Maha's point, as you grow and you learn, you'll start to learn when you can start pushing back or raising your hand. And what I would say is don't be afraid to do that. Even if you may not have had the same experience as the person, you have the latest and greatest knowledge that is out there with the latest and greatest technology and everybody is just as equally as smart and has a really great idea so raise your hand share that idea and if somebody shoots it down okay try again the next day and keep trying until your voice gets heard that is the best thing I can say you're going to have moments you're probably going to want to quit we all have I have several times being a woman I have always been the only woman in the room as a rule. It doesn't matter where I go, how I do it, more I'm than not, I'm generally the only woman in the room. Also, because I don't have that, that professional same makeup as everybody else, I can get challenged more. But I will tell you, I don't back down. I will absolutely stand up, and, but I'll be professional and I will keep my head on straight and I'll be like, okay, well, you know, we can agree to disagree and that's fine too. We're all smart. We're all really intelligent. You have to do what Maha said, keep your determination. Rise above it is the next piece that I'll add to it. Don't let it discourage you and keep trying. And every day, keep coming back with a new mistake or a new idea. Don't give up. Thank you both. I've had a chance for these employee spotlights that we do. I've got a chance to interview both Maha and Rachel, and they're just incredible people. So it's awesome to be here speaking with them today. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the kind of place that you don't want to stay, that you don't just want to dig in and, um, and stay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just start out. So I just want you guys to hear that you don't need to be someone else to succeed in this field. You're part of the tech community now. Your voice matters. You are part of shaping this community. You can be yourself. You can be you and thrive in tech. You don't need to be someone else. 
if you find yourself in a workplace where you feel like you do have to be someone else to be accepted, there's a time to move on. If you find yourself in a toxic workplace, do not feel obligated to stay there. The first workplace that I was in, and it was just briefly two or three months, it was almost all men, which is not unusual in tech. Um, but I would be in my cubicle and the next cubicle over guys would be gathered talking about the women they had dated and been with, and they would be ranking them one to 10 on how pretty they were. And I had to listen to that. I was the only woman back in dev in a corner cubicle, listening to my coworkers rank women right next cubicle over. And it wasn't the only thing about this workplace. There were, you know, management would come into the developer office space and would cut loose and yell at the development team when things were going poorly. The developers then would be working long 50, 60 hour weeks to accommodate this guy's demands. Um, and <laughs> hopefully this isn't too much detail, but one engineer had a bleeding stomach ulcer from the stress levels. This was like very toxic workplace. Um, and I felt like this was what tech was. <laughs> this was my first tech job. I thought this is kind of like what it had to be. I felt like I had to go along with that culture to fit in and kind of try and be bro-y with these people. And ultimately, I felt like I had to be someone that I was not. And that approach did not go well for me. By the time I got out of there, I was severely depressed to the point where I, it was affecting my memory. I was having suicidal ideation. And just before I left, I finally told some other developers at the company how much anxiety I had been having, and they told me they felt anxious all the time too. So this was just a bad workplace. It was not a good place to be. And I never want you all to get into that place, to get to that place. That's not what working in tech is. There are so many not toxic people and not toxic workplaces out there. If you get into that kind of place, reach out to your network. People are going to understand and they're gonna to want to help you find something better. I was able to get out of that situation with the help of my network. You have the Code Louisville and Code Kentucky networks to lean on if you get into that kind of situation yourself. Please don't think that toxicity is what tech is. It's not the only option. If you find yourself in that place, know there is better and keep looking because you will find a place that you can be yourself and be appreciated for that and thrive. And on the positive side of things, there's a big difference um, from that place to where I've been since then. At my next workplace, it was also a team with mostly men, but no one ever said anything inappropriate to me like that. Um, my manager never yelled at me. He told me to go home when I would get to working later than five. Like <laughs> there, were, there were enforced work-life boundaries. Um, my manager set an example of taking mental health days and encouraged the team to do so. And in the place where I am now, I do consulting. And if I end up with a client who makes even a single comment that's inappropriate, my manager and my whole team come alongside and support me. I don't have to be the one to raise my hand and say, this is a problem because the rest of the team identifies it too. They care about it. Um, they care about making sure I'm okay and addressing the situation if it needs it. And I just wanna encourage you, you can find that kind of workplace too. You can be you in tech and be supported and appreciated for it. You don't have to be someone else. You can be yourself. Yeah, I completely um, echo with um, Shelly. So when I got into the big financial uh, group and that's how I thought like, you know, this is how the big companies are. And if, if you want like strive into this, this is how this is how you have to be. And this is how hard you have to be. You have to like, you know, you just doesn't have any work-life balance. Like literally you have to work all the time. But when I actually, the current company that I'm working in right now completely changed that kind of mindset for me. And as Shelly said, like, you know, as a team, we actually move forward. As a team, we are like, we support each other. And it's like work-life balance is like, um, I, I, I said like so many times, like I'm a single mom and in a day I have to do so many things to take care. So, um, and it's my work-life balance is like very flexible. And that's the thing that I never thought like actually IT companies can be like this too, right? It was like, it, is this real kind of a thing? But this this can happen. So I echo uh, Shelly. So um, sometimes you might just get a toxic environment. Sometimes 
Um, you might just end up in a really good environment. And after that, when you change a job, you might actually end up in a very toxic. So you don't, the decision is completely yours to make. Did we lose my heart? Yeah, the decision is completely yours to make. So, um, yeah, um, that's it. Sorry, I think my internet connection is unstable. I don't know if I missed anything. Rachel, were you saying something? Well, I think you just dropped out for a minute, but no, I agree with you. I Bravo, Shelley. I, I echo everything that you say 100%. Yep. yep. It's I haven't like, shared these experiences before um, specifically, but I feel like it's really important that we recognize that there are some places that are not great out there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not the only thing that there is. I just want to encourage you all. That's not the only thing that there is. There's good places. Yeah. And, and in my 20 years of working, I've had more good than bad, if I'm being honest, because I'm very much like Shelly. If it's not a good work environment, I'm not going to stick around. So yeah. Shelly and Maha hit the hit the nail on the head, which is what I told you guys earlier, network. Your network is so important. Build it as much as you can, anytime you can, because it will save you so many times, but also bring you new opportunities you didn't even know was there. And when somebody that you trust brings you in, it's a different, it feels different and it's very different experience. And what's awesome is that, you know, with experiences of being someone who's sort of coming from outside the tech world and into it, you're bringing a unique perspective exactly. and you're, you're able to help encourage and create the kind of community that we want to be. Like you can be part of what we want, what we want to be. Um, I don't know if that's very articulate, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, you're just not thinking in one single lane, right? Like your vision is very broader and that's how it's, so coming from a different background will really help you like actually strive in the IT technology because the domains are very different. The businesses are very different here. So if you, you can understand, I, it really helped me to actually understand the perspective of the business very much with all the background that I have. Awesome. We've got a couple more questions here, so I'll try to get through them. Rachel and Maha, um, in your jobs, you work closely with clients, engineers, and other stakeholders. So what advice would you give someone new to the field about specifically working with a team, working with a tech team, and the kinds of people you encounter there? Do you want to take this, Rachel? Absolutely. So what's really important is it really depends on the type of job and type of role you decide to take. If you're going to go into a consulting job, in some consulting jobs, you're always going to be client facing to some degree in some level, but don't fret and don't fear because as Maha and Shelly have already told you, we're a team and we're all in it together. And a lot of times, most places use agile methodologies and agile practices. And if you haven't learned about those things, you should definitely learn about them. And what agile does is creating a safe environment for people to speak up, to raise their hands, to work, to say things, even if your clients are there on the phone. And so don't be afraid to speak up, to say something. And if you feel like you could do better, ask. Ask the people on your team, ask your person, your, your scrum master, your product owner, your product manager, what can I do better? How can I speak? What can I say? But honestly, to Shelly's point, just be you and just do it and do the best that you can. And you'll gradually learn on your own when you get into those situations. Same thing's going to apply if you flip it to the other side. If you go into the IT corporate side, which I've been in as well, you don't necessarily have external clients but you do have internal clients where you're going to be in the same scenario, the same setting. You're going to probably ultimately end up talking to people that are in the business. And you're probably wondering, how do I do that? You just do it. You just be you. There isn't no special sauce to it, if I'm being honest. You raise your hand, you give your update, you say if you have any questions or issues. No one, and again, if it's the right work environment, no one's going to have any problems with that or say. And if there's coaching or advice, we all help each other because we're all in it together. So I would say the best thing that you can do when you join any team, whether it be corporate or whether it be consulting, is to just be yourselves. Don't be anything else. Communicate the way you communicate. And then as you learn and go, you adjust, but you choose how you want to adjust and what you want to say. Yep. And that, 
that's what I would say. Maha? Yes, I completely echo with you, um, Rachel, over there. I, the, the first thing I would say is communication is the key with clients, with your team. Communication is the key. Don't hesitate to like actually talk don't hesitate to say your opinion because that that can really happen when you're in the team and when you're like actually jumping in and like I don't know at least I used to feel like I don't know do you think like my opinion really matters here you know that's the first question that your brain completely keeps telling you but don't listen to your brain at that time whatever the opinion it is whether it like it's right at that point or not it does matters you speaking up and communicating is really important um, and uh, to, to Rachel's point here, asking feedback, and that's what I do all the time. Sometimes, um, you know, it really helps for me, especially like I when I actually enter the team, I always let the team know in upfront that if there is anything that I have to improve, please do let me know, like, right. So that don't tell me at the ending. Don't tell me at like once everything is done, right? Because it's done and I can't do anything about it. Tell me up front. If, today, if I'm actually not doing something right, just tell me that this is, this is, this is where I have to improve. Um, so when you actually let the team know about it, so it, it will be helpful to you and it's easy for them to like actually provide feedback. Sometimes, you know, it's the opposite side too. They cannot just like, they might be a little bit hesitant of providing feedbacks like your teammates would be, would be noticing something about you um, and they might like be thinking like a little bit hesitant about like providing the feedback. So when you communicate it upfront to your team, so it's like easy for them to provide the feedback and feedbacks are the best way you can actually improve yourself every day we we don't have to be perfect and it, we can't be perfect the first day right we learn we grow we grow from the feedbacks and um that's your that's your like the first step and the second thing is definitely communication um always like uh, speak your opinion speak out Tell to the clients, engineering stakeholders, no matter whoever they are in whichever position they are, don't keep your opinion to yourself. I'll say from an engineering perspective, having been in academia before and now being in tech, um, in academia, the model is like a very hierarchical model of learning of, you know, there's the experts and you learn from them and they're the ones that know how it is kind of thing. Um, I've found software engineering to be a very collaborative learning kind of community of people. Um, you know, seniors are going to want to know what you have to say about the problem too. You know, it's, it's all different perspectives on things. And in software engineering, a lot of times there's not like one right way to do it. Um, <laughs> there's just, you know, pros and cons of different ways. So. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool that way um, as a collaborative learning kind of community. We have a couple more questions, but I want to make sure that we have time also for you all um, to ask questions if you have some. Um, so I think maybe, how do you, Maha, Rachel, how do you want to? I say we just, don't, if you want, we just open it up. Ask okay, me yeah. Yeah. Ask yeah. Yep. All right. Let's open it up. Does anybody have questions? Um, things that you'd like to hear about, experiences that we've had, um, any advice, things that you're worried about. Um, yeah. And if you don't want to speak, you can write it in the chat and we chat. can read the question out loud. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think we have a question in the chat. Have yeah. any of you experienced prejudice as a woman in the workplace? If so, how did you handle the situation? I would, I mean, I don't know, Haha, Shelley, do you guys want to speak? I can tell you I have definitely experienced it many times in my career, um, fortunately. Um, do you guys want to talk and talk about an experience or do you guys have an experience too? Yeah, but you, you can go ahead and talk about your experience. Yeah, go for it. Rachel. Yep. All right. So I'm just going to be open and I'm going to be transparent. I would say that I've had many experiences, but I would say the one that I remember the most was sitting in a room full of all men, which is generally how that works. 
and they were trying to fix a server and they couldn't figure out how to get that server back up and running. And I'm just sitting there and listening. And I'm like, I know how they can get this back up and running. And I spoke up and I said what I thought that they should be able to try to do and, and the issue, because we had just made a new deployment and we just needed to roll back and then retest it, right? And that's essentially what happened. And they based, one man basically told me that I just needed to sit there and look pretty. And I said, oh, okay. So I just sat there and I looked pretty for about 30 minutes. And then they still couldn't come to a conclusion and they couldn't come to the solution. And I said, hey, would anybody like to know what pretty looks like now? And they were like, sure. And then I told them again that I really felt like the best solution was we needed to roll back the release of what we just deployed because that is what took the server down and that has an issue. And it was the only thing that was gonna have to do it. And I understand that it was complicated and we don't wanna do that, but it's the only choice we have to do. So we can sit there and keep talking about what we can or can't do and debate it, or we can go ahead and start working and be done faster. And it actually worked. As soon as they rolled back the release, they basically had the server up and running. Essentially, there was a piece of code that was not a closed loop and it needed to be closed. And so it took us a little bit of time, a few days after that, to figure out why it crashed and why the error log kept filling up. And then we were able to figure that out, redeploy, and everything was great. So yes, does it happen? Absolutely. Is it fair? No. But... Again, what I will tell you is you can't let it discourage you. You can't let it get to you. And you just have to sit there and wait. And eventually you can do it. But I'll be honest, if it, if it gets to an environment where it's toxic, because sometimes that has happened too, then you talk to your manager. And then if your manager is not, you know, if that's not working, then you go to HR. These are very, you know, there are a lot of laws. There are a lot of things in place to protect us so that we don't have to deal with those things. I have a tendency to let things go probably too much and too far because it's like, to me, is it worth the value or doing the job? But what, I, what I've learned along the way is by me not speaking up and me going and taking that next step meant somebody else went through that and that wasn't fair. So that's kind of changed my outlook a bit. As soon as I see that it's impacting somebody else, that's when I usually raise my hand and speak up. But really, we should be brave and have courage and speak up for ourselves because we're all important and we're all worth it. And when that happens, it's not okay. And that's whether you are a different race, whether you are a woman, whether you are trans, whether you are non-binary, whether you're a man, honestly, I mean, it can happen, right? It just all depends on the scenario. Somebody who is foreign, that's a man coming in, maybe doesn't speak English or has an accent, they can sometimes also get discriminated against. So even if they're white, it happens. So if you feel that way, the best thing to do is you should talk to that person, whoever it is. If that doesn't work, go to the next person and go to the next person. But always remember that if you don't speak up, it will happen to somebody else. 100% right. Yeah. So I will real quick share this one experience when I was actually working um, into the tech job. And that was like actually my first tech job. And I got this project. Um, I immediately jumped from an associate to senior and I was like dealing with the project, right? Like leading the project. And there was this senior engineer who would like call me, like he would say, can I talk to you for a minute? And I would just go and he was like, what do you think about yourself? Like, literally, do you think like you can just come and lead the project and do whatever you are? You don't even have my experience. You don't even have anything like you, you're not even like you're just a woman. And you're just like he was like literally degrading me, bringing up all the points like I was um an Asian woman, I was, I just came into a tech job and how can you just come and like lead? He was like, you are so small. He was trying to make me small. Um, and then at that time, I remember I was really angry. And when I'm angry, I really speak out loud. <laughs> so when, I, I, when I'm angry, I become strong. So I'm like, it's none of your business. It's like, it's none of your business. If you feel so like, 
I was like, you're, you're, you're being very little to me right now by like actually calling me and trying to make me small. So if you do this again, I'm going to straightly go to the HR and complain about you. If you have any problems, sir, like if you really have any problems, sir, please talk to the HR. But whatever I'm doing here is nothing to do with you. I was straight in front of him and I'm like, I bent down. I sat to to a senior engineer who was already in that role. And then I was like, I didn't do anything wrong. But um, I went there, sat in a corner. I was anxious. I took some long 10 breaths and I'm like, I didn't do anything wrong. So no matter happens after this, I thought I would be fired after talking to that engineer like that. And whatever, no matter whatever happens to it, I'm not going to regret it. And honestly, he, nothing happened. And um, I was there, we successfully deployed their project. I got all the credits in front of the management and everything went so smooth. So you will have that kind of experiences. And one thing I would say that never give up, never give up for anyone. When you feel whatever it is, just don't give up. We've got a few questions. We've got quite a few, let's see. Um, someone's asking about Scrum. Uh, is Scrum much different than being a project manager? Um, so Scrum Master, um, so he can actually play or he or she can actually play a role of a project manager. Um, depends upon the, the, the settings and it depends upon the environment, right? Like as Rachel said, Rachel has like many roles. Like she is an engagement leader. She plays as a scrum master sometimes. She is a lead sometimes. So as a scrum master, depend, depending upon, if there is a project who, are, who already has a lead and a project manager, I am like just doing the scrum. What is scrum? A scrum basically scrum master take care of team uh, being like highly functional try to like actually be that single point of contact who help the team to be in that safe agile practices to Rachel's point and try to remove the blockers for the team try to make sure that everyone has that voice you know to let their opinion out and um, basically a scrum master role is to keep the communication intact within the team so yeah a scrum master can be a product product owner sometimes, project manager sometimes, engagement lead sometimes. It just depends upon the uh, project settings and environment. Yep. And so Maha, just really quickly, really quickly, does a scrum master solve all the problems for the team? No, the scrum master doesn't solve all <laughs> the problems for the team. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, it, so each, we, so it's a team and each person and each uh, role in a team has it like each engineer and a scrum master a lead everyone has their own role so yeah scrum master doesn't solve all the problems <laughs> scrum master is just there to facilitate to help yes. people understand who needs to connect with who to get people moving in the right direction so that's what's really important project manager has a very specific role. They're responsible for reporting a budget. They're responsible for making sure that everything stays within budget. They're responsible for making sure that there's a, a set scope and deadline that is being delivered for that specific project. And as Maha said, sometimes you play that role and you play the scrum master role and maybe you're a product owner, it just all depends, but it's very open and very flexible. Got another good question here. How do you balance the imposter syndrome in getting in this field? It's so big. I feel like I'm constantly trying to find the balance between I don't know everything and I know nothing. Or I know I don't know everything and I know nothing. <laughs> so what I will say, and you probably heard me say this in this, is it's everyone's day one, no matter what happens. I will tell you that when I started working at Terrazzo, I understood IVR, I understand telecommunications, but I did not know anything about Twilio, Twilio Flex, Twilio Segment, or any of that stuff. So even though I've been in IT for several years, it was my day one. And I just basically own it and ask a lot of questions. I don't, I don't shy away from it at all whatsoever. Now, when I get in front of a client, I'm an expert and it's my job to be the expert and you fake it till you make it. 
But behind the scenes, you ask questions. You, your team knows you're new. They know you don't know everything. They know you need to learn. Rely on them, depend on them, and just don't be, really don't be afraid. Just be you at the end of the day. So, and at the end of the day too, you do know something, even though it's your day one. You went to boot camp. You learned core principles. You understand enough about technology. Just as like, yeah, it's my day one for Twilio, but I've implemented IVRs before. I've implemented infrastructure before. I have implemented software before. I understand the core concepts. Do I know all the ins and outs? No, but I can quickly figure out how to relate them to get it going. But also I still depend and rely on my team and ask a lot of questions to my team. And they're always very, very understanding to that. I'm like, okay, dumb question again. And they're like, it's okay, Rachel, just ask your questions. <laughs> so just remember that no matter what you do, where you go, you know more than you realize. And it's every Wednesday one. <laughs> yeah, 100% agree with Rachel there. I always feel that even today. And the just uh, as Rachel said, don't hesitate to ask questions. And it's okay to feel like that. Uh, another question. Are any of you all familiar with 3JS? I am I'm not, not familiar. I'm not. I'm not, See? I'm not either. They don't know. <laughs> well, I am. Just, just to tell you, I mentor and teach and coach, you know, Amazon Tech U associate solution architects. And I know a lot about blockchain and Web3. And that's specifically what I'm teaching them on. And tonight they came to me and said, Rachel, what about soulbound NFTs? Can we use that? It's not transferable. And I'm going, wait, what? What is this? I don't know what this is. And I admitted into this, this group of young people that I'm teaching and mentoring. I didn't know that. So I said, you know what, guys? I want you to go and look at dids and I want you to look at, at the hash and I want you to look at this new soulbound NFT that I know nothing about. And I want you to come to the table with pros and cons. On the, on the side, though, I'm going to go research this and figure what else this is and ask questions. You're not going to know everything like 3JS. I have no clue. But now yeah. I'm going to go look it up because I yes. want to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A really cool thing about tech, though, is that, you know, it, you have your sort of like, you, you'll learn your best practices of stuff, your kind of core principles, um, like Rachel was talking about. And for instance, if you're using a programming language, you know, you, object-oriented programming, this is a big, you know, concept and you have, you have patterns for development. And, you know, I, I said, I've, I've, you know, gone between several different languages just this year. Um, and, uh, and I can do that because they all share a similar structure, right? They share similar patterns. So you have to learn sort of like the new syntax of each one, the, you know, specifics of, you know, exactly how it's built, but, but, you know, you're able to do that translation more easily because they're all, you know, they, they're programming languages. They're sort of built similarly. So that's, I like that about it. Um, another question. Um, Paul says, I have a good friend who is an Indian woman looking to get into tech. She's currently in the U.S. but needs a H-1B sponsorship. Any tips from Maha? Um, so, um, Paul, um, what I would say is like LinkedIn really helped me, honestly. And um, uh, to Rachel's point, um, I always um, like, you know, improved my LinkedIn profile and presented. So I always got the opportunities. And the first thing that as a non-immigrant, the first thing that I would actually ask them is like, I need a sponsorship, right? Um, I, I don't have like uh, the permanent residence or um, the, the, um, the work uh, authorization, uh, So, but I need a sponsorship for, from the company. So the first thing that I would actually check with all the other details is the sponsorship. Um, Yep. Yep. So yeah, I always make my profile and I also mention in my profile that I'm an, a non-immigrant who's looking for a H-1B sponsorships. And there are so many companies out there. Um, like I, so at some point I was actually doing my own, um, like findings, uh, from Glassdoor, um, and Dice and Indeed and all, like I go there, I present myself, um, because it's, it's, 
at, at some point it was not easy for me to like actually find companies for sponsorship. But nowadays there are like so many companies who are coming forward to do the H1B sponsorships. So yep, LinkedIn, uh, put yourself up there and mention that in your profile that you're looking for a sponsorship so that like, you know, in the search criteria, it falls and you will be, uh, your friend will be getting all the positions um, uh, who can actually um, offer the H1B sponsorship. Um, one, other, one other question on here. Do you feel like companies gatekeep more so with women in your experience? Depends on the company, depends on the experience. So have I experienced it? Yes. But here's what I will say. I, I, when I've experienced it, and I will tell you probably the latest example that I experienced it with is somebody that I actually get along with very well and I'm friends with and I'm still friends with and he was my client. And he literally would sit down and walk me through and explain to me every little thing and every little piece of tech and detail. And finally, I just said, you know what? Hey, I don't need you to explain this to me. But then I watched him to a man who was working with him. He didn't. He just threw it over the fence. And it's funny because that man was less technical than I was. And I actually got it more than he did. And the man was super frustrated because he wanted more handholding. He wanted somebody to walk him through it and he wasn't getting it. And then I was getting all that hand holding and I was getting annoyed and frustrated because I hate people holding my hand. I'll be honest. I am a self learner. I like to self teach. I like to figure things out. I like to be able to ask questions when I'm not sure and how I want to be able to do it at my own pace in my own time. And I don't want somebody to just sit there and speak to me. I'm more of a hands on kind of learner. And so again, just be transparent, be professional and be honest with, hey, I've got this. I don't need you to explain. I'll let you know if I have questions. And you may have to do that a few times because their intent, and so that's the other thing I always try to do is I always try to assume good intent. Their intent is not really to do that to you. I think it just naturally happens because some guys, specifically this one, and he was South African, actually just wanted to make sure I was okay and make sure that I felt like I had support. It wasn't intentional at all by any means. So just be honest, speak up. But honestly, like now at Terrazzo and most of my consulting career as a consultant, you're pretty much just expected to kind of, you know, figure it out. And if you need help, raise your hand. Like that is just the way that it is. And so it really doesn't matter whether you are a woman or you're not. If you need help, you raise your hand. If you don't need help, then they leave you alone kind of thing. Um, it's usually more in that corporate kind of setting where you might see it less in the consulting setting. Maha, Shelly, what do you guys think? Um, I, in, in that really problematic workplace that I was in, probably what I experienced more, I mean, I got the job, <laughs> I got the job, um, but it was like, uh, I probably had less sort of like social support because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a bro. <laughs> That's yeah. the long and the short of it. You know, it wasn't there. Those an, informal connections between coworkers weren't there for me there because it, it wasn't really a totally inclusive workplace. Um, so your ability to be supported and promoted um, when you don't have, you know, peers who are on your side is kind of rough. Um, I would say that the companies that I've been at since then, you know, I, I look for women in leadership. Um, and I think that that's a pretty good marker. So the manager that hired me on at the next company was a woman, um, at the company that I'm at currently, the hiring committee had a woman who was in my interview. Um, and, um, and now, you know, we have a woman in the C-suite. So it's kind of like having, having women in leadership is a really good, good signal kind of, um, Maha. Yeah, I had the same experience as Shelly, like um, uh, I was just not a man to help, right? You know, I was like, um, they would not even consider me like being present there, right? Like, you know, in the team, I was just there, sitting there doing things and they would just have their own group discussions and they were like, nee, you wouldn't even, nee, you wouldn't even get it kind of a thing. So um but um, like, yeah, after that, um, my experiences, like I had good and bad experiences. Like I had uh, people like, you know, Rachel, like they were like trying to help me 
feel that hey you know like I I meant like to support you um but you know not in any other way but um I used to like grab help wherever I go and as I said I was very determined and I was like it's okay it's okay and I have learned my ways it was not easy I was I felt anxious I felt depressed I felt so many things and out of all I was like it's okay I'm going to do this in my own way. And it's okay even if I get fired. <laughs> the first thing, I guess, the best thing anyone would actually feel, don't, don't. Plenty of other opportunities and you will find your own company like I find mine. So you will. So don't be afraid. It's okay to get fired because you will learn. The biggest key is like learning every single day from your failures, from your success. And honestly, if you're learning from your failures, you're learning really well. So it's okay. Well, I don't think we have any more questions. And I know that we are over time. Um so <laughs> yeah thank you all so much for being here today I know this was awesome and as a woman in tech myself definitely learned a lot and I came from a sports background so a lot of similar uh challenges let's say um but also some really really good things so thank you all so much for being here with us uh students thank you for attending um friendly reminder if you're using this as your tech event um, to fill out the form uh, in your Google Classroom uh, so that you get credit for that. Um, and we will be recording, or we did record this, so we'll have that up on YouTube uh, probably sometime later this week. Thank you all so much for having us. Um, I just hope that you all are able to, you know, take something away from this for your own, you know, future endeavors in tech. Welcome to the community. Welcome. <laughs> yep. Welcome We're to the community. We're excited to see you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, and all the best for your future endeavors, guys.